Tony Kukoc, aka The Waiter, aka The Croatian Sensation, is one of the first and one of the best Europeans to ever play in the NBA. He was a key piece to the second three-peat of Jordan's Bulls in the 90s, and he unjustifiably got snubbed for more screen time in the Last Dance documentary. But how good was Tony Kukoc really, and how much he helped Jordan in the second three-peat? Find out in the rest of the video. Cop the sports bug from his father. Tony's father was a sports fanatic, and he used to bring Tony along with him to every possible sporting event. Tony instantly caught the sports bug, and he started training soccer and table tennis as a kid. Extremely coordinated for his size, Tony was a regional champ in table tennis as a young teenager, and he only started playing basketball after he got too tall for soccer. His first basketball club was Yugo Plastica, where he began training alongside Dino Radia, a Hall of Fame inductee in 2019. And even though he picked up basketball extremely late, slightly before his 15th birthday, coaches quickly recognized Tony's feel for the game. Encouraged, Tony used to train up to seven or eight hours a day and would often come in and shoot before the cleaning lady arrived at the gym. Hard work paid off, and just a couple years later, at the age of 17, Kukoc started playing professionally for Yugo Plastica. His first contract was worth only 100,000 Deutschmarks over six years, equivalent to $50,000. Still, Tony later said he was just happy to play basketball and that he never thought he was underpaid. Radia and Kukoc soon became the backbone of one of the most talented generations in the history of European basketball. They led Yugo Plastica to two consecutive EuroLeague titles in 1989 and 1990, along with two domestic championships. After Radia left the team, Kukoc single-handedly led the team to another EuroLeague victory with another Yugoslavian championship and cup, winning every possible trophy in the 1991 season. Tony was named the MVP of the EuroLeague in 1990 and 1991, and was widely regarded as the best player in Europe. International success Yugoslavian basketball in the 80s was the greatest basketball hub outside of the US, and their teams dominated international basketball competitions. Just 60 miles north of Split, where Tony and Radio were born and played basketball, another basketball Hall of Famer was emerging. It was the late, great Drajan Petrovic, one of the best shooters in the history of basketball, if not the best, if you ask Reggie Miller. Vladi Divac, another Hall of Famer, was also playing on the Yugoslavian national team, as well as Zeliko Obradovic, who later became the winningest coach in the history of EuroLeague. Yugoslavia won the silver at the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, losing closely to the Soviet Union in the final. In the 1990 World Cup in Argentina, Yugoslavia avenged the loss and defeated the Soviets, with Tony Kukoc as the tournament's MVP. After failing to reach the gold medal game at two consecutive competitions, USA Basketball decided to send pro players to the next Olympics, which would affect Tony Kukoc as well. He just didn't know it yet. Jerry's boy in Barcelona Kukoc, Petrovic, and Radja were the leaders of a newly formed Croatian team that qualified for the 92 Olympics after the country declared independence from Yugoslavia in 1991. Drajan Petrovic, who just finished his best year in the NBA, averaging 20 points for the Nets, warned his fellow Croatians about the physicality of NBA players. At the time, European players were very skillful, and their training was always about fundamentals and technique. However, they didn't do any weight training, and they simply couldn't compete with the NBA athletes. Tony Kukoc received a crash course at NBA defense because he was hounded by Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan, who had been hearing about Tony Kukoc for more than a year from their hated GM, Jerry Krause. Jerry's boy got their full attention from the start and ended up scoring four points in the first game. In the finals, the Croatians and Tony Kukoc were much more prepared and even kept the game close in the first half. Kukoc finished with 16 points and nine assists, and showed that he could play with the best players in the world. Kraus drafted Kukoc in 1990, but following Drajan Petrovic's advice, Tony opted to stay in Europe and signed with the Italian side Benetton, where he played for two years. But after winning a championship in Italy and another EuroLeague MVP in 1993, Kukoc had nothing left to prove in Europe, and it was time for him to make the leap to the NBA. Coming to America Tony first came to the U.S. during the 1993 playoffs, when the Bulls played the Knicks in the conference finals. He visited the practice facility, where only one Bulls player was practicing. Michael Jordan was drenched in sweat, with his father watching from the sidelines, and Tony asked him, why are you practicing so hard so close to the game? 
Jordan said that he wants to be sure in his jump shot when the game starts. Tony said that MJ's relationship with his dad reminded him about the relationship he had with his father. However, when James Jordan tragically passed away, Michael retired from basketball, and Tony didn't have a chance to play with him right away. But that also helped him and allowed him to have more minutes and touches in his first NBA year. And despite the fact Pippen hated Tony at the Olympics, Kukoc said that Scotty helped him tremendously when he transitioned to the NBA and that he's one of his favorite teammates ever. The relationship wasn't derailed even when Kukoc hit that game winner in the 94 playoffs against the Knicks, with Scotty sulking on the bench. In his first year as a Bull, Kukoc averaged 11 points and 3.4 assists in 24 minutes per game. It didn't take him too long to get used to NBA basketball, and in the second year, he already jumped to 15.7 points. 5.4 rebounds, and 4.6 assists, displaying his great basketball IQ and all-around game. Sixth Man of the Year and three NBA titles. The 1996 Chicago Bulls are often considered the best team of all time. Other than hungry and motivated Jordan, prime Scottie Pippen, and arguably the best rebounder of all time in Dennis Rodman, they also had Tony. Kukoc was so adaptive and basketball savvy that he would often play three different positions within one game. He could play the point forward position and distribute the ball, be the primary scorer when Michael was resting, and also play off the ball as a catch and shoot option. Scoring 13 points per game on efficient 49% from the field and 40% from the three, along with four rebounds and 3.4 assists, won him the sixth man of the year award. The Bulls won their fourth title, and Tony was proving to be the pivotal part of the team. In the following years, he kept the same production, and with 13-4-4 splits, he was arguably the best third option in the NBA. He had some memorable games in the playoffs as well, especially in 1998 in the Eastern Conference Finals against Indiana, and in the finals against Utah, where he almost single-handedly closed Utah in the fifth game of the series. Tony scored 30 points on 11 of 13 shooting in Game 5, which the Bulls lost in the final moments and would need Jordan's shot over Russell to win the championship in Game 6. Final Years In the 99 lockout season, after the last dance, Kukoc remained one of the only guys from the championship squad. At the age of 30, he was still in his prime and showed a glimpse of what his numbers could have been if he had his own team. He averaged 19, 7, and 5, and these numbers could have been even better if the Bulls weren't such a bad team. Kukoc then played for the Sixers for half a season in 2000 and half a season in 2001. In the games Kukoc played in those two years, the Sixers recorded 61 wins and 19 losses, while in regular season games in which Kukoc did not play, they dropped to 45 wins and 39 losses. After playing with Jordan for all those years, he displayed great chemistry with Allen Iverson, another high-scoring guard, and it was a shame Kukoc got traded to Atlanta and couldn't help Iverson in the 2001 NBA Finals. He played in Atlanta one more year and then signed a four-year deal with the Bucks, which would be his final NBA club, and where he had more problems with his bad back than he did with players on the court. Rich Legacy In Europe, Tony won everything he could by the age of 23 and has probably the thickest EuroLeague resume ever. Pre-NBA Kukoc was a slender 6'10 small forward with fantastic ball control and soft touch, and he draws many comparisons to Kevin Durant. KD thought so too, and he rocked Kukoc's jersey in practice last year. When Tony first got to Chicago, they forced him to bulk up significantly just because they needed a power forward, even though it wasn't his natural position, and he lost some of the agility he had in Europe. Still, Tony adapted quickly and became one of the first stretch fours in the history of the NBA. If he didn't play alongside MJ, who would take the majority of the shots, Kukoc could have easily averaged 20 each season in his prime. However, he was always a pass-first guy that preferred to play team basketball, and he said he would always choose winning against great individual statistics. Kukoc, alongside Divac, Radja, Petrovic, Marcelionis, and Sabonis, was the pioneer of European basketball in the NBA and paved the way for the Nowitzkis, Gasols, and Doncic's of the world. To answer the question from the title, Tony was a phenomenal basketball player, and he should have been in the Hall of Fame already. Today, he still lives in Chicago and works for the Bulls in an advisory role. He's also still friends with Michael Jordan, and the two play golf together from time to time. Tony called MJ after the last dance and told him that he's glad it's over, because he got more calls when it aired than in the previous 20 years.